treasurer. And we try and do our best to keep Mark happy and the observatory afloat. We are an all-volunteer, nonprofit organization, so we very much appreciate donations of both money as well as gifts of time. So if you have more money than time, we have a donation box back there by the door, and we can also take credit cards online. Or if you have more time than money, we always are appreciative of volunteer support. You can learn to help run the telescope. You can help host groups here. We could use somebody to help put together our scrapbook. There's all kinds of fun ways to help support the observatory. <coughs> and I want to recognize all our volunteers. If everybody could raise their hands. Do you have any questions about volunteering here? The people with the round buttons. That's what, when you come and volunteer here, you get a button. <laughs> as well as a chance to. And a t-shirt. And a t-shirt. T-shirt. So we're always grateful for our volunteers, and we have a complete training program here as well that the volunteers can tell you about. One more thing about donations and, and uh, credit cards. You do not have to be here to do that donation. You can do it on the website. There's a donate tab on the, uh, on the website. You can do it to go to PayPal. You do not have to have a PayPal account. You can use your debit card or credit card. And all donations go directly towards supporting the educational programs here at the observatory. A lot of people think that we get funding from the school district. We do not. We're a standalone, separate, nonprofit organization. And we've had more than 55,000 visitors. About two thirds of those are kids. And we really appreciate all types of support that help us to continue our educational mission. ago, something like that, uh, we had originally thought that I was going to be coming here to talk tonight around this time about what it's like to actually get to be flying in space. Uh, because at that time, the scheduling was looking like I might be able to come back about now and talk to you about that firsthand. But um, programs are going a little slower than we had wanted to, and uh, we're, we're, getting, we're getting ready to fly in space. And so we altered the title a little bit here. But I want to talk to you a little bit about what, that's, uh, what that program's like. Um, Heck of a lot of fun. I'm an incredibly lucky person to get to work in the position I am at Southwest to, to be in this position, to be getting ready to do not just one, but three space flights next year. 
So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on that and uh, tell you how it is that a PhD research astronomer gets to go and <laughs> do such such amazing things. Andrew is right. That was really the uh, the uh, the uh, carrot that got me to, to dangled in front of me to to get me to actually come to move here to Boulder. I was so happy in Tucson. I really didn't want to leave. When well, Alan dangled the F18 keys in front of me, uh, that was that was really legit. Um, what we were doing back then, um, just to let you know what that was all about, was um, trying to demonstrate that you could actually use a high performance uh, jet aircraft like that, a military aircraft that's positioned in a number of places in the world, relatively cheap to fly, uh, and I'm saying that relative to some other bigger NASA airborne sort of assets that, that were out there. We were going to just doing this little demonstration project to show that one could use the backseat of a two-seater F-18 like that to do astronomy from. And in that particular case, we were demonstrating that we could fly and chase down asteroid occultations. So uh, rather than sitting under the shadow of the moon when the moon passes in front of the sun for a total solar eclipse, as you probably know, you have to be in a pretty particular place on the Earth right where that shadow passes through. Very similarly, we observe little mini eclipses like that for asteroids when they pass in front of distant stars from our point of view. Right? So asteroids in our solar system, looking out to the more distant stars, occasionally you'll see them pass in front of a distant star. It'll make that star wink out temporarily as that little narrow path of the shadow of the asteroid passes over you. And those are particularly interesting for those of us who study asteroids because you can use the timing of that little mini eclipse, that occultation, to deduce the size and the shape of the asteroid, something we normally can't do because they're just little points of light in the sky. And we were trying to demonstrate that for these very, for very high priority events, always, as we as astronomers know, important and interesting astronomical events cause clouds. So we were trying to demonstrate that we could get up above the clouds and go fly those occultation missions from an easily deployable aircraft like that. Or out over water, where it's a little hard to deploy a telescope like that. So Alan brought me on board, and within two months of hiring on here at Southwest, I was off at Edwards Air Force Base doing my initial training for the Hornet and altitude chamber and all that kind of stuff. Well, um, that puts us in a relatively unique position, because there aren't too many PhD astronomers out there who fly F-18s and other high-performance aircraft like that to go do the astronomy. Um, there's probably about maybe, you know, this many of us, right? So um, that puts us in this position to take advantage as this new, um, let me see if my first slide gets here, um, this new way of getting into space, we were right in the thick of being pretty well qualified to jump into that market and look at these vehicles which are being developed for adventure tourism to be able to take advantage of that and think in terms of the research opportunities that those vehicles offer us. So uh, we'll get into that in just a second. But that, that's kind of where we're going with this. Um, so wind the clock back. Well, even before we wind the clock back, how many of you, raise your hands, would like to fly in space? Yeah, right? That's the, that's the reaction you're going to get most, most places, right? Who would not want to fly in space, right? What a great view. What a great opportunity. Um, up till now, however, that's a, that's a opportunity that's been kind of reserved for, you know, the, the best of the best, the elite, the NASA astronauts, right? Um, you, it, it's, a, it's a pretty hard, you know, selection to get to that point, and um, not many folks are that privileged. Well, enough folks have gotten sort of fed up with that way of getting to space, right? Particularly Bert Rutan, the aeronautical genius out in Mojave, California, who has designed more unique aircraft. Most people in their careers as an aeronautical engineer would be honored and would stand out if just once in their career they designed an amazing breakthrough new aircraft that maybe would win an aeronautical award for you know, conceptual design and, and you know, out of the box thinking. Bert's done it like 37 times, right? The guy is an absolute genius and way back you know, way earlier than 2004, um, you, you go, as, as far back actually as about the 1980s, he had going through his mind to be able to take some of this aer aeronautical technology, these carbon composite airframe designs that he was building, and thinking about ways to take them higher and higher in the atmosphere, and in fact, even out of the atmosphere. And so when the XPRIZE Foundation uh, came along in the late 1990s and early 2000s and said, look, we're going to put up a prize, a $25 million prize. Uh, no, I don't want to say it's $25 million. It was less than that. Um, 
They're not the actual number. Why can't I say that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, it's the, the Google Lunar X Prize is the big 25 one. Um, anyway, a big prize, millions of dollars for the first private, non-governmental uh, uh, entity that could build a vehicle that could fly up out of the atmosphere up to the internationally recognized definition of space at 100 kilometers, 328,000 feet, fly up there in a vehicle, come back down in that vehicle, and then do it again within a week in the very same vehicle. If you can do that, we're going to award you this prize. While well, Bert was thinking, well, that's not, I can, I can do that. I'm already drawing up ideas for things like this. And that idea, that basic uh, concept he had was, 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 oops, was Spaceship One, um, which in 2004 actually did win the X Prize competition. Um, the genius of Bert's design was he took advantage of the technology and the techniques we had as far back as the 1960s with the X-15, right? Carried aloft under the wing of a B-29 back then, or a B-52 back then, I'm thinking of the X-1, the B-52, dropped from the wing of the B-52 and then rocket up to, uh, up to the outer atmosphere. Uh, Bert took that design on, built his own version of that vehicle um, with his newer, lighter carbon composite uh, designs and the genius idea of making the cockpit of the spaceship identical in design and function to the cockpit of the carrier aircraft. And he did that so that every time the uh, pilots in the carrier aircraft are flying the carrier aircraft, they're also gaining experience in the behavioral characteristics of the spaceship. And so the two crews can switch back and forth uh, equally well and uh, makes it that much more reliable to be able to fly. Well, in 2004, that prize was won. The basic idea is you drop off the, uh, the belly of this uh, air carrier aircraft at about 50,000 feet, ignite your rocket engine, solid rocket engine on the back, and rocket up out of the atmosphere. And it's a wild ride. I didn't bring image. Uh, I should have. I should have thought to bring video of this for you. I'm sorry. That was an oversight on my part. Um, you can kind of see what's going on here. You're up at uh, at uh, you're you're up in space. You're you're up above anybody who flies in this vehicle uh, up to those altitudes was getting their astronaut wings because you're up above 328,000 feet. In fact, look at the tail number on the aircraft. Right. Three two eight kilofeet. Okay. There you go. So they they picked their tail number knowing what they were doing. And the sky is black, the curvature, the earth is curved, you see the thin blue ribbon in the atmosphere, and you're in space. Well, as this was going on, of course, a certain British gentleman over in, in the UK uh, with, the, with the Virgin logo uh, uh, to his credit, uh, Richard Branson, uh, got the idea, well, you know, uh, maybe I ought to be partnering with BERT and take this system and develop it into a commercial platform for taking all of these people who want to go to space and making it a reality for people. And so that's where we are today. Um, in 2004, well, yeah, let me back up just a second. Here's what the inside of this vehicle looks like, uh, getting ready to, to land back at, uh, uh, back at Mojave. You can see the ground down below here in a, as it's in a steep turn. There's the, the actual airport complex at Mojave out the windows there. But you get the sense of what the view is like inside the cockpit of that particular pretty small vehicle. Spaceship One was relatively small. It's now hanging in the Smithsonian. You can actually go there and see it today. It's, it's not that big. I actually got to sit in a thing like this, and it's, it was pretty cramped, but the view is great out of all these little windows. You got this really peripheral view, even though it looks very crowded. Um, so fun vehicle to fly. Here's the, the actual winning, uh, the winning date there. Um, everybody was, was flying high. I'll tell you, um, uh, it, was a, <laughs> it, it was a little bit of a, of a dig in terms of the, the can-do spirit that we saw out there in Mojave that day. Uh, with what can be done in the private community, no government money, just Bert and his friends and the folks who really wanted to make this happen, putting it in, making it happen, and doing it. Um, somebody got the bright idea in the audience as this vehicle was being towed back in after landing. And there, were, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people out there that day, and the, the spirits were running high, and somebody got pretty enthusiastic about it and made a pun based on the name of the spacecraft. They held up this big poster board sign that they drew up there on the spot. Spaceship One, NASA Zero. It was a, <laughs> it was, everybody liked it at the time. It, 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 Bert has got a little bit of a thing about, about NASA, so he, I guess that went a little, a, little, a little farther than maybe it needed to go. We don't need to dig at NASA that hard, but uh, it just shows what can be done, though, when you, when you lift the burden of some of the, you know, the regulatory environment and the, you know, we all want to be safe, but you don't want to be so safe that you don't actually do anything. So um, uh, the spirits were running high that day, and it was a, it was a pretty good Yes? If you want at the end of your talk, can you pull up the YouTube video? 
Oh, that'd be great, because I think it'd be kind of fun for folks to get to actually see this in action. Um, that was a, that was a, that was, I'm sorry, that was a, that was a over, oversight on my part. I really should have put some cool video in there, because there's really some awesome video out there. So this was the state of things back in 2004. Spirits were running high, the XPRIZE had just been won, and right around the corner, it seemed, was going to be this new era of space tourism. And that, and frankly, was the reason that this prize was put into place, was to foster more of these vehicles to be built so you guys can all get to go fly to space like we all want to do. And the real push for that back then was always envisioned to be space tourism, right? The same people who are going to pay $60,000 to go climb Mount Everest and risk your life, which is what it's all about. I mean, it costs about $60,000 to hire the Sherpas and get the guides and the permits and all the things it takes to go climb Mount Everest, and you got about a 1 in 10 chance of dying in the process, okay? And... Think about how many people every year will go and do that to go climb Mount Everest. Lots and lots and lots of people do that every year. Those are the same kinds of folks who are going to pony up the bucks to go and do this kind of stuff here. Okay? So that's kind of where things stood in 2004. Um, Alan and I went out and met with Bert. Um, actually, we, we met with Bert before the XPRIZE had been won. We, uh, Spaceship One had just landed the day before after one of its test flights on the way prepping for. Uh, that, the, the prize winning fly, uh, flight and uh, we and Al, uh, Alan and I sat there with Bert um, in his little conference room around his uh, conference room table which is made out of carbon composite which we thought was a nice touch um, <laughs> and we shook hands and made the deal that we were going to fly Spaceship One Alan and I were going to go and fly on Spaceship One to do some preliminary experiments to show that it's not just tourism, these vehicles are great opportunities for Alan and people like Alan and I to take that experience that we had gained flying the F-18s and doing science in those kinds of high performance vehicles and get us the chance to do our science in space, right? The same way that marine biologists and botanists and, and you know, entomologists here on the earth go out to the field every day to do their research where the subject of their research matter is. And it's about time that space scientists get to have that opportunity as well. These vehicles are perfect for that. And so Alan and I were pressing, and have been pressing, uh, this idea that we can use these vehicles for what we call REM, research and education missions as well. Hundred, again, hundreds and hundreds of people, kids get to fly every year on NASA's Vomit Comet, the KC-135, well, it's not the KC-135 anymore, but basically the parabolic research aircraft that allows you to go up there and get a chance to get 23, 25 seconds at a time of zero G as you're flying in these parabolic arcs over the Gulf of Mexico. Hundreds of people do that every year to get those few precious seconds of microgravity time to do their experiments in biology, material sciences, pharmaceutical stuff, okay, human reaction to spaceflight and things like that. What would you do if you had the opportunity to fly those kinds of experiments on much longer parabolic arcs out of the atmosphere? opens up a whole new, uh, whole new way of doing your science. So we've been pressing that, and meanwhile, the entire community has been coming along. Things are moving along. In those, in those years since 2004, since Richard Branson has thrown his, his dollars at, or his pounds, I guess, in this case, um, at the problem, um, Spaceship One has migrated over into Spaceship Two, the new generation vehicle. We see it here flying over. Um, during the uh, spaceport dedication in uh, New Mexico. Uh, this was back in, uh, I want to say 2008 or so. I can't remember the exact date, but that sounds about right, maybe 2009. In fact, uh, there's a little food tent here. Here's the actual uh, spaceport, uh, which will look like this inside, big airport facility. Um, there's a big crowd of people here. This picture down here was taken from that Chase aircraft this is the view looking down, and I think I was in that little patch of people there at one point, but um, th the point is, things are happening. The runway's been filled, the spaceport's getting ready to go, and very, very, very soon, uh, folks like, like, like you and me are gonna be flying uh, to space out of that place. Um, the vehicle, in this particular case, Spaceship Two now, you can see has changed configuration just a little bit. We now have two carrier aircraft cockpits on either side with the much bigger Spaceship Two slung underneath the wing here. And this is real hardware, folks. This is not just pie in the sky uh, PowerPoint presentations. This is the real thing. The vehicle's been up there flying. It's been doing test flights. 
guide flights. I think it's done over two dozen guy, uh, glide flights now. Just last, not last week, the week before last, at the end of the week before last, Spaceship Two has just now completed the very last step before its first powered test flight, where they're going to actually ignite the rocket engine and go fly. And that was to pump the oxidizer through the plumbing of the system and then dump it off the rocket nozzle off the back end, which is what you're seeing here. Um, this is a really interesting system. Um, the vehicle is meant to have two people flying up front, uh, Virgin Galactic pilots up front, six passengers in the back, and then the rear half of the vehicle is the oxidizer tank, which is laughing gas, and the fuel, which is solid rubber, like uh, has the consistency of the rubber in a, in a pencil eraser. Okay, it's the same kind of rubber fuel that's used, uh, that was used to, to be the, uh, the solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle. Okay? Except in this case, uh, the oxidizer is different. They're pumping laughing gas into it. So you, you ignite that with the oxidizer and that rubber and it burns and out goes the back will be a big, oh, 30 or 40, 50 foot long plume of flame powering this, uh, this vehicle up, uh, up into space. So it's coming soon. In fact, I've heard rumors that perhaps that powered test flight might happen on Monday. So we will see. Um, don't hold me to that, though, because Virgin Galactic, Scaled Composites, the spaceship company, are notorious for flying when they feel that it's right to fly. And that's why, frankly, we're still here about four years after they thought initially we'd be flying to space already. And I, I say that in a good way, because a lot of people have been starting to get kind of antsy about it. It's like, when are they going to fly already? Well, as somebody whose pink little bottom is going to be flying in that vehicle, <laughs> I want them to fly when they're ready to fly, and not one second before. Okay? So I think it's a good thing that they're slowly getting at it, taking their time, making sure everything's working right, and doing it in a very safe and methodical way. So, okay, but they're not the only players in the game. It turns out Virgin Galactic has a lot of competition. Um, there are uh, no fewer than five companies right now that are uh, flying various or getting ready to fly various types of vehicles with various different ways of getting up to suborbital altitudes. Uh, there's Blue Origin, Explore, and Mastin, and Armadillo, and Virgin. Uh, and as you can see, all of their vehicles look a little different. Uh, just let that one soak into your head for a little while. You can kind of see the person sitting in the vehicle there. Um, you, you know, it, the beauty of commercial space is that you know, it's out there for competition. And you know, it's like, where, where do people want to put their dollars? Okay, So I think it's good that there's competition. I think we may find that some of these methods may or may not work so well with the paying public, but we'll see. Um, the companies that are furthest along are, of course, Virgin Galactic. They're getting ready to fly next week. Um, and it turns out X4, X4 Aerospace, in this vehicle here called the Lynx. I'll show you more about in a little while. Um, these other vehicles you see are not, these are not PowerPoint things. That's, that's Blue Origin's vehicle, flying for real. Uh, here's a uh, Mastin vehicle, flying for real. Okay? These are, those aren't probably like gra computer graphics. That's the real thing. So things are getting ready to be, uh, to ha to be happy. Right. That's flying for real. That was not flying for real. That's <laughs> very good computer graphics. Okay. That was very good computer graphics. Um, but, I'll, but I'll tell you, they're, they're, they're pretty close. They're pretty close. I mean, it's not that they're not flying vehicles. Armadillo is flying vehicles, just not that one. Yet. Okay, right. So the basic idea, let me, let me just back up just for a second and give you the sense of what's going on here. Um, what is this, this suborbital flight stuff all about? This is the Alan Shepard special. Okay? Those are, some of you are way too young to know who Alan Shepard was, but uh, first American astronaut to fly in space. Um, so rather than uh, launching fast enough to be orbiting, literally orbiting all the way around the Earth, okay, like the space shuttle, like the Apollo capsules, like all the other Earth orbital vehicles we've flown in the past, these sorts of suborbital space flights are flying you just fast enough to pop out. You're going straight up. This is kind of like a Wile E. Coyote thing, like in the cartoons. Okay, So if you guys go back and watch your Wile E. Coyote, car, Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons. Imagine the road runner. Imagine the coyote with a rocket stack to his back. Yeah, so this is gonna be a ride like that, okay? So this is this is a coyote, wily coyote ride out of the atmosphere, fast enough to pop you up over a ballistic arc. Um, you're flying up to heights of something like 360, 370,000 feet, 
okay, 135 kilometers up, way up above the altitude that defines space. Up out the top, you're flying about a three or four minute zero G arc over the top before you then start falling back into the atmosphere where the G's pile on and you plow back through the atmosphere to come land back at the same place you launched from maybe a half hour before or 20 minutes before, okay? So that's the flights we're talking about. Yes, sir? If this is like Wild Lee Coyote, then are we going to either get smashed by a rock or <laughs> Hopefully neither one. There's, a, there's, an old, there's an old TV show that you guys don't remember because you weren't born then. Uh, there was a very famous, very famous guy who used to go on TV and one of his little bits, what he had, had this little helmet thing on and his little fake space suit and the television guy next to him would ask him, is that a, is that a crash helmet? And he used to say, I <laughs> hope not. <laughs> so, that's, that's basically it. No, so yeah, this is, uh, it's, it's this, the whole, all of these systems, all these systems very seriously are designed to be much safer ultimately per flight than the space shuttle, okay? Space shuttle odds were something like about 1 in 78. When I interviewed for the astronaut office back in 2003, they sat us down very seriously at the table and said, have you, re you know, have you really know what you're doing with this, okay? Have you talk to your family, do they understand the risks and all this? Because your odds of dying on this job are like dying in combat, okay? It's that dangerous. This is designed to be at the sort of hop in a car and drive down the highway level of risk, okay? Which is by far the most risky thing that anybody here in this room has ever done is hop in a vehicle and get out there on the road with all those other crazy people, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Isn't there a company in Louisville that's building something like this too? Uh, yes, in fact, um, they, um, you're, you're, referring, uh, you're referring to Sierra Nevada Corporation, SNC. Sierra Nevada is actually the prime contractor for the rocket motors, the engines, for the Virgin Galactic vehicle, right? So they're the ones that are doing that. Also, they are building their own vehicle called the Dream Chaser which is getting ready to be, it's already done a parachute kind of fly around aerodynamic sort of test on the, on the parachute harness at Jeff Gove, well, it's Metro Airport now. Um, it's getting ready to go out and do some parachute drop tests out in Mojave, out in California. And some of that's happening right here in the local area. So our own community right here is taking part in this new revolution, and it really is a revolution. Okay, so lots of folks are doing this stuff. Okay, what's the key here? The key is that these kinds of vehicles offer us very much cheaper and more frequent access to space, okay? It's the chance, literally, for all of us to get to go and do this at costs that are, for the moment, a bit beyond what probably most of us in this room can afford to do. But if you'll remember, back about, what, 12, 15 years ago, those big flat panel, huge, big flat screen TVs that most of us have in our house now were beyond the range that most of us could afford to buy them. Okay. It took the folks who could afford to do that to bring the costs down for those of us to go now you know, to Target on a, or, or Walmart and buy the thing for a lot cheaper. And that's basically what's going to happen with these vehicles as well. Um, the, the, the folks that go to Richard Branson parties will be buying the big first expensive flights. And once all of those, the economy of scale goes, those prices are going to come way down. I, I know what those recurrent costs are. I, 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 we've talked to them in great detail. Uh, I can't tell you what they are because somebody will come and break my legs. But uh, what I can tell you is what I've been telling people um, a lot is if you want to get to go and do this, if you want to fly in space, okay, and, and, and we're at the point where we're really finally finding out, we really can seriously say, if you want to fly in space, start saving your money. <clears throat> and what I tell people is start saving money as though you were going to save for an extremely extravagant family vacation to Europe, okay? And by the time you've saved up that money, by the time you've saved up that money, the prices of the flights will come down to match you, and you're going to get your chance to go and do it. Okay. So this is this is this is serious. The, the thing is really really happening. Um, their flight. We're talking about flight rates. That uh, that X Corps vehicle I showed you. They are building their vehicle to be able to fly to space twice a day, twice a day. Somebody goes, flies up to space, they land the vehicle, they come down, they service it, and two hours later, another customer is in there flying to space again in that vehicle. Okay, this is not the space shuttle. Okay, and so we, we are literally talking hundreds or thousands of seats and experiments flown each year to space at costs that are an order of magnitude cheaper than what we as uh, me as a scientist could ever fly my payloads before on a sounding rocket or that you could ever have a chance to go and actually fly. We're 
you're going to get down to these points where you can do it. Okay? You're going to get 10 times the microgravity time on one of these flights because you're flying up out of the atmosphere for three or four minutes, not just you know, 25 seconds at a time, three or four minutes at a time. And it's not just that it's that much longer zero G, it's that much cleaner zero G. When you're flying on those parabolic aircraft, you've all been flying back to Denver here, right, over the Rockies. Okay, everybody fasten your seat belts and the stewardesses, please sit down because it's gonna be a bumpy ride on the way in. Those, you get those same bumps when you're flying the zero G aircraft stuff, right? And when you're, when you're flying over your arcs, every bump, every bit of turbulence on the aircraft translates into messy microgravity conditions in your experiment, which is no good. Well, if you're flying outside the atmosphere altogether, you get much cleaner microgravity, much more akin to what you actually get on the space station. Okay? At, for space station costs, you're talking two or three orders of magnitude cheaper to do your experiment. So great opportunity for us to get up there and, and do these sorts of things. Um, and again, this is not a NASA vehicle. You don't have to pass all the NASA safety reviews okay, and all the stuff that goes. I can go to, my, I can go to Radio Shack and buy the pieces to put my experiment together and go fly, okay? Now, not me, because I'm gonna do stuff a little bit differently, a little fancier, but the point is, you can go to Radio Shack, okay, and buy your stuff to go do your experiment. As part of a school classroom experiment, your classroom could raise enough money on a weekend car wash to buy the ticket to put your experiment to go fly in one of these vehicles, okay? Think about that. When school classrooms can afford to do a car wash, build, fly an experiment during the course of a one semester class. Think about what that opens up for getting kids involved with doing things and thinking about careers in space sciences and space engineering. Okay, whole different world. Indeed, and thank you for reminding me of that. And that, that only expands upon the point that I was trying to make that this is something that's part of our local community. And indeed, if, if Front Range actually is, is successful with their bid to become a spaceport, you're gonna have, be having some of these vehicles flying right out of here, out of Colorado. So we hope that comes to be, we hope that comes to be. So um, something else that's good about this is being able to fly at more flexible times. If you wanna study Aurora, Northern Lights, how about flying into the Northern Lights and actually studying them there? St think, think of studying the actual ionospheric interactions that are going on right there in the aurora in real time. Okay. Well, Spaceport Sweden, which is already built and waiting for Virgin Galactic to fly their vehicle up there, what a great place to fly out of. Okay. You'll have that, those kinds of opportunities, especially when you can have the spacecraft sitting there ready to go and say, Get ready, because in an hour we're going to go fly. We can do that with these vehicles. Unheard of in other types of, of space operations that we've ever had, had the opportunity to do before. So um, I'm one of these guys, OK? So I can think of some stuff I'd like to do here. But I'll tell you, I'm talking with my friends in these other communities. And there are all kinds of chances for folks in these other communities to get to go and fly. I think particularly fruitful ones are going to be these, life sciences. I think there's going to be a lot of people, think about it. Up till now, we've only had data on very healthy, fit, you know, test pilot type people flying to space maybe, maybe two or three times in their entire career. And maybe only about, you know, a dozen of those folks flying every year. Okay? Think about when everybody, okay, people with chronic medical conditions and on some weird medication and, you know, if, Grandma down the street, okay, is going to get to go and fly to space. What's that going to do? That's going to open up the spectrum of different types of people, okay, different, different body reactions to the experience of flying in space. That's going to give the people who study the human adaptation to space flight a much broader range of people to study <coughs> and how they respond to space. Not only the broad range, but hundreds, thousands of those people are going to be flying a year. So the life sciences folks are really chomping at the bit to get more data on many, many more people flying in space and how they adapt to microgravity and the stresses of space flight. Um, likewise, think of the opportunity for folks who are trying to develop technologies, bits and pieces of other spacecraft stuff that they want to put on other spacecraft that are going to fly off to or Pluto or you know any place in space. 
you want to fly that stuff in space to see how it behaves before you actually put it on an expensive spacecraft that has to work right, because it's the only mission we're going to get for 10 years to Jupiter. Well, when you have the opportunity to really fly these things back and forth, you can get this sort of iterative chance to find out what works, what breaks, and make it work and test it before you ever have, we don't have that capability right now very, very well. So that's another great opportunity for these things. Uh, okay, so let me get on to some of this fun stuff here real quick. So, uh, get rid of the words and get on to some more fun picture stuff. What's it like getting ready to fly? And how, how is it that I have this opportunity? Well, I have this opportunity because the company I work for and Alan Stern, the guy I work for, has the vision to say, look, this is important. We as scientists want to bring our, our scientist colleagues along with us in a sense. We want to show them that this is worth doing. And so our company has ponied up the money, uh, 1.3 million bucks so far, to buy the tickets and build the experiments and get us ready to go on a bunch of these flights so we can show our colleagues that it's worth doing. That's basically what we're doing. So my company has paid for my flights to space. It's, it's pretty simple as that. And uh, that makes me one of the luckiest people in Colorado, I guess. Anyway, so um, the basic idea is uh, that, they, that we've set up a, a couple of demonstration level experiments that we're going to fly as we fly these vehicles. Uh, we bought the flight contracts for services with XCOR and Virgin Galactic. We bought, so far, we've bought nine seats so far with options up to 17 seats. Okay, we're buying a lot of seats to space. We have a bigger space program right now than NASA does. So, um, and we're training ourselves up. Um, I'll, that's what the rest of this is gonna be about, is just showing what it's the fun of, of getting ready to train and do all this stuff. We're gonna, we're gonna fly a bunch of space flights. We're gonna document what it's like to do that. We're gonna, we're gonna analyze our data, do our experiments, publish those results, share them with the rest of the science community, our colleagues, and try to get our colleagues more excited about flying in space too. And then when more of our colleagues are flying, the people who fund experiments maybe will decide that, hey, maybe there's something to this, and we'll get a chance to go do this more, and we'll get a chance to do more of our cool science um, the way we really want to go and do it. So uh, we bought six seats with X-Core Aerospace. This is this Lynx vehicle. Unlike the Virgin Galactic vehicle, which gets carried aloft under that carrier aircraft, dropped off at 50,000 feet, and then rocket to space from there, the X-Core Lynx vehicle rockets right off the runway, it takes off like a really amazing jet fighter, right off the runway, straight up to space. Over the top, okay, ballistic arc, back down through the atmosphere, and lands on the same runway it, it took off from. But unlike the Virgin Galactic vehicle, these engines are relightable. So you, you fly up, you turn them off, you coast over the top, you're coming back down, you're gliding into your landing and things don't, you just don't like the way it looks, you can turn them back on and fly around again for another attempt at the landing. Okay, really cool vehicle. The really cool thing about this particular one, I'm actually in some ways looking forward to flying on this vehicle more than the Virgin Galactic flights because this is a two-person vehicle. It's just me and the pilot sitting up front. And even more fun, the pilot sitting up front, I know I've flown with him before in the F-18s. He's a former space shuttle commander, and I get to go fly to space with him now finally. And what's even better than that, well, I don't know if it's better than that because well, there's a catch to it. What I think it's even better than that is um, we are flying, we've made arrangements with x -Corps Aerospace that Alan and I will be flying this vehicle as flight test engineers for them. Before they are flying this vehicle for paying customers, we will be flying during the test flight phases of this vehicle um, during, that, during that program. So it's a little more risky for us. Um, in fact, the last briefing I went to out there about a month and a half ago, two months ago, um, one of the people from XCOR actually, I, I could not believe the words I heard coming at me. They actually asked me, do you want to be on the second flight? And um, if you think about that for a second, it's one thing to test fly any sort of high performance aircraft on the very first time or second time it's ever flown before. But now you think about flying this vehicle to space that's never flown before. And that you kind of puts you into the level of, you know, this is something, you, you, every now and then you have those 4 a.m. moments, you know, you kind of like, you wake up and you just, your mind is racing, can't, you just can't get back to sleep. Well, I've had those 4 a.m. moments about this. And uh, I'll tell you, it's a real good gut check to make sure you really, really understand what you're getting ready to do. Um, so I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm, I'm good to go. I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. Um, I can't wait, actually. Actually, I can't wait. So we have six seats purchased on uh, the x Corps vehicle. We've bought three seats, three flights on the Virgin Galactic vehicle on Spaceship Two. Um, we're going to 
fly those um, next year, uh, uh, probably near the end of 2014. Uh, I've forgotten what seat number I am. It's like 234 or something like that. Um, I got a little letter from Richard Branson saying, you know, we're looking forward to you guys flying with us because it's going to be a really cool thing to show what you can do with research. And oh, by the way, um, with a little wink of the eye, um, you know, he kind of reminds me in the letter, he says, and by the way, just think about this, you're going to be one of the first thousand people to fly in space. Not, not on their vehicle, just the first thousand people ever in the history of humanity to fly in space. And I thought about that for a second, it's like, eh, I mean, I, I prefer to have been maybe the first one or two, that would have been kind of cool. But, but, but it's still kind of neat to be, you know, the first, one of the first thousand people to get to go do something. It's just kind of, kind of neat. Okay, so, what are we going to be flying? Each of us are going to be wired up. Whenever I fly, here's, a, here's Alan Stern, by the way, um, wired up with this biomedical harness. This is a, a little kit that some folks of you may have already worn here just for just standard medical testing. It's a little pocket thing, maybe a little bigger than the cell phone that you wear, and you're hooked up to a blood pressure monitor and to heart lead. So it's measuring your heart rate and your blood pressure um, at rates that you can tell it every two or three minutes to do that if you want to. Well, we're going to be wearing those when we fly. And to, and to demonstrate that it's not that big a deal, we went and we flew the F-104 wearing it under our, under our parachutes and flight harnesses and stuff. So here's Alan walking out to the aircraft wearing this thing underneath. He's all wired up with all this stuff. And I did the same thing, and I can tell you it was, it was not a problem at all. It's going to be easy to do. And the reason we're flying this experiment is basically to show our colleagues who are getting ready to fly also that every time you fly, you can be potentially gathering data for your life sciences colleagues out there who would really like to have that data. So consider always trying to be generous with your own flight in the sense that provide those life sciences colleagues information to help them at the same time that you're getting to fly. So that's the message we're trying to, trying to do with that. Uh, I'm an asteroid guy. I like to study asteroids, and I like to understand what it's going to be like when we as astronauts get to fly to a near-Earth asteroid and explore them in person. Well, the surfaces of these little asteroids, these things are so small. They're not much bigger than Berthoud, okay? Or, in, in fact, some of them are about the size of this observatory. There's practically no gravity on these things. So I want to understand what the geology is like in a regolith. Think of a lunar-like surface with all that rock and gravel and grit and stuff, but in an environment more like on the space station where there's practically no gravity. It's not like on the moon where you walk around and you bounce around on this stuff. This is going to be like floating around with the dirt. And I want to know what that's going to be like. And so what a great chance for me to fly a little box of rocks kind of an experiment on this suborbital flights to kind of, kind of get some preliminary data on those kinds of things. So I'll be flying my box of rocks. That's what we're calling it, actually, a box of rocks. In fact, here I am with my box of rocks in the back of the 104 playing around with the preliminary version of it anyway. And then we're going to fly the very same uh, camera system, telescope system, we flew in the F-18s. Here's our camera that we flew in the F-18 uh, out at NASA back in, uh, what, 1998 through 2002 or so. Some images we had from it when we were chasing down occultations. Here's a schematic diagram. But the basic idea is we're going to be flying the same system to show that you can do the other types of science in, in these vehicles, not just the kinds of science that deals with microgravity, but the kinds of science that will take advantage of being up out of the atmosphere. So you can observe in wavelengths that we can't observe from down here on the ground. So we can look close to the sun in a way that you can't do with the blinding atmosphere down here on the, on the Earth. Or that expensive NASA spacecraft can't do because they will risk their instruments by looking that close to the brilliant light from the sun. So we're going to be demonstrating that we can do those kinds of astronomical observations from these vehicles as well. So they're pretty simple experiments, but they're demonstration level things to get our colleagues interested in just thinking about the possibilities. That's really all we're trying to do. Okay, uh, our team, there's Alan Stern, uh, the boss man, if you will, who conceived of this whole thing and is basically making sure it all, it all comes to pass. Myself, my F-18 days out there, and our colleague Kathy Olkin, who's uh, got a lot of experience flying on NASA, the, the uh, the Kuiper Airborne Observatory to observe occultations in the past. She is serving as my flight backup for the Virgin Galactic flight, and then she's got her own Virgin Galactic flight set up after that. And uh, that's our team at the moment. And we know all of this is real because we have our own flight patch. So <laughs> you know your program is real when you have a flight patch. So there we are. And uh, in fact, this is, we, we, these are all sewn up and already on our flight suits. So we're all, we're all ready to go. Okay, so whoa, whoa, what happened here? Okay. 
slide thing got a little, uh, little anxious there. So we're getting ready. Uh, we're literally getting ready by training. Now, we're training ourselves to a level more than you would have to. Okay? These vehicles, all of them, Spaceship Two, the, the x Corps vehicle, are literally made, and I mean, I'm not saying this in some funny way, they are literally meant for grandma next door to go fly to space. And I can say that because literally there is an 85-year-old grandfather who's gone through the centrifuge training to be ready for his Virgin Galactic flight. Okay? So if the 84-year-old grandpa down the street can go do this, anybody can go do this. And that's the whole point, and that's the beauty of it. Okay? So, and, and the beauty of that is that you don't have to go through special training to get to go and have this wonderful, marvelous, amazing experience. Now, do I think you should go through some kind of training? Yeah, because I think it'll heighten your experience. It'll make you much less apprehensive walking out to that vehicle if your body knows and your mind kind of knows what to expect. So I think some training is probably a good thing, but you don't have to do it. Now, Alan and I, on the other hand, we're going up there to do a job. We're going up there to actually get some work done. In the case of our experiments, for certain we want to do that. But don't forget, we're flying as the test engineers. We have to, we have to actually help fly the vehicle on those test flights for x -Corp. So we have actual work to do. And so we're putting ourselves through a little bit more extra training to really be ready for this. And that's including uh, these types of centrifuge runs. There's a facility called the, the, uh, it's the National Aerospace uh, Technology and Research Center out in uh, Pennsylvania. They have one of the world's best centrifuges out there for, for prepping yourselves in this. Um, we've done all of our uh, aeronautical training. Um, this is me, you'll see some video of this in just a second, in that centrifuge flying that, um, that pressure suit. It's the same, same suit the astronauts wear on the shuttle. It's uh, actually the same suit that the uh, U-2 pilots wear. Um, you're looking at about $125,000 of pressure suit here. And I got to fly it in that centrifuge uh, on 12 runs up to 6 Gs, one hour and a half. <laughs> so really pushing ourselves. Why 6 Gs? I didn't tell you about this part of it. Flying this vehicle up out of the, uh, all of these vehicles operate pretty much, the physics is about the same way. If you want to get to this point from down here, I don't care what the vehicle looks like or how it lands or takes off, one way or another, you've got to get going about Mach 3 up out of the atmosphere, okay, pushing about three and a half Gs so that you can coast up out of the top of the atmosphere and make it up to those altitudes you want to get to. And when that means then that you're going to be falling back into the atmosphere at about Mach 3, three and a half, and decelerating at about six Gs on the way back in for a little bit, okay? So you got to get ready for that. So what do six Gs feel like? Um, you feel squished? Yeah, you feel squished, okay? You feels like... So 6 Gs means that I'm standing here right now. You guys are sitting here right now at 1 G, 1 Earth gravity. Okay? 6 Gs means you'd be feeling like there were six of you. Okay? Can I oh, come, come sit on you for a second? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but imagine six of you sitting on top of you, squishing you down. Okay? That's what it feels like. But you only get that for a little bit, so it's not that bad. I'll, I'll show you what it feels like. You'll get a little sense of what that feels like. So we've done the centrifuge training. Um, Alan and I have done a lot of jet flying in the last uh, decade. Um, as I said, I hired on uh, at NASA, or I hired on at Southwest to go out fly with NASA out at the uh, uh, out at uh, Dryden uh, Edwards Air Force Base in the F-18s. In fact, that's one of the F-18s that I got to fly. Um, got a lot of flights in that F-18. Well, there are two of them that I got to fly. And then in the last couple of years, Alan and I have been doing this guy a lot, flying uh, the 104 um, with uh, with Comrade. Uh, uh, his name is Rick Svetkov. His last name is Svetkov, and so of course his call sign is Comrade. Um, but uh, we've flown this 104 a couple times with him, and uh, you know that's to you know you can pull the G's in the centrifuge, but it's another thing to do it in a real vehicle, wearing the life support gear, okay, and really feel what that what that's like. Um, different story altogether. Besides, it's just fun. <laughs> and then of course there's the zero G part of it. Um, I've done a lot of zero G flights with NASA, flying for research purposes. But the cool thing is that you can go out there right now. You can go out there right now and buy a commercial flight with Zero G Corporation and go and get to do this yourself and float and feel what that Zero G feels like. It is an absolutely magic experience. Okay? It's a club you join. 
Um, I'm here to tell you, and I don't mean to, I'm not, I'm not saying it in a nya nya kind of way. I'm just saying it, unfortunately, it's the, it's the truth that I cannot describe to you what it feels like. <laughs> it is just something you've got to do to really feel what, it, what it's like. It's, I, can, I can describe to you that it, it's magic. I can describe to you that it's taking every bit of gravity tension away from your muscles and just being able to float completely free and relaxed. Um, it, it's the magic of being able to take my 35 millimeter camera that I've used all my life and pass it across the aircraft to somebody else with nothing more than the muscle, than the tension to take. You know, you, you just when you just relax your hand, it kind of does that, right? That's the only exertion I had to do to grip the camera and push it across to the guy uh, across the aircraft from me <laughs> in zero G and watch it slowly drift on a straight line. And it's just magic. It feels remarkable. Um, it is so fun. And what, what I'm telling you is that you can do this right now. Um, uh, it, it, uh, so instead of saving for an extravagant family vacation to Europe, save for, eh, you know, you want to go to dinner in, at Disney World this weekend, okay? Well, that's about what you're going to pay. Um, well, maybe a little bit more than that. It's, it's, um, it's uh, $5,000 to go fly this vehicle and get that opportunity. That's, I mean, it, okay, it sounds like a lot of money, and in some ways it kind of is, but it's not that much. $5,000, you can go and have this experience, okay? And I strongly, strongly urge you to find a way to do it, okay? Go to the Zero G website. And the way you do this is, you just go to their website. Uh, it's gozero-g.com. You just gozero-g.com, and they have a schedule of where they're flying when, and you just go, and you literally, you just go book a flight, okay? Yes. So um, the zero G corp uh, the, the zero G corporation flight, this commercial flight, is about an hour and a half long. You take off from wherever you are. Like I, I fly out of the, with them out, out of the Cape, out of Cape Canaveral, quite a bit, and we end up flying across the peninsula of Florida, off to the Gulf Coast, and we fly over the Gulf of Mexico. Um, about an hour and a half flight. Um, they fly, so they fly kind of a racetrack. Uh, course in the sky. So you're flying down one leg and you're flying a few parabolas and you do a turn, a little rest period for two minutes, and then you fly down the other leg a couple, three or four parabolas and turn again. They fly 15 parabolas total on their flights. Um, to start you out, they fly a Martian parabola to give you one third G first, kind of see what that feels like, get your body kind of sensing what to go, what's going to be coming up next. Then they do a one sixth G lunar parabola. So you can feel what the Apollo astronauts felt like on the moon. And then they do the zero-G parabolas after that. Um, they're designed, they very purposely try to fly very gentle parabolas because they don't want you to be sick. It's not called the vomit comet for, for no reason. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll tell you, very few. Uh, it's something only about 3% of the people who fly that vehicle get sick. Okay, um, it's, it's a remarkable experience. So go do it. Go zero g dot com. Right? You'll, you will not regret it. I guarantee you, you will not regret it. Unless you get real sick. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody know who this is? Does that face look familiar? Anybody in this room? Top Gear. Yeah, it is Richard Hammond. Uh, uh, so three weeks ago, Richard Hammond and I did a zero g flight together. We were filming a new BBC show that he's doing. And I was his host for the day, showing this one experiment. And so I, um, you're going to see me next year, probably around Christmas time, maybe Thanksgiving time, on a show with Richard Hammond flying in zero G. So um, uh, fun things can happen when you get to go and do these kinds of things. OK, so Richard did great. Yes, he did. He, did, uh, he kept it down, had a great time. Uh, the film crew did a good job. Uh, I was a little concerned about that, quite frankly. I've flown hundreds and hundreds of parabolas. I've done this a lot. and. I know where the problems are for people. You know, I, 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 you know don't, don't do things like turning your head like this around. You know, that's going to make you sick. I see so many people on their first parabolas. They're like, wee, and they're flying in circles. I'm thinking, ah. <laughs> so, uh, but he did great. He did, he did outstanding. We had a lot of fun. You, you can, he's smiling all the time. Uh, OK, so my point is get ready. OK, can you fire up? Let's turn the PowerPoint off for a second. I want to fire up. There's a file there. And uh, if you could, when it does fire up there, if you can pop it to full screen as soon as you get it running. Yeah, that's the one. Yep. I just want to show you some video of what these things are like. I think uh, this symbol right down here 
we'll pop the full screen. There you go. Okay, this, uh, this is me doing touch and goes in the F-18 in my old days, uh, 12 years ago out at NASA Dryden. Uh, I think that's me checking to see if the gear are up. Um, so that was me when I was still a young guy flying F-18s. Um, here's me flying uh, 104 out at, uh, out at uh, Cape Canaveral. In fact, that building right there is the vehicle assembly building where the space shuttles are assembled, the launch pads are out there, and we're flying, basically, I'm just going vertical right over the uh, shuttle landing facility. Okay, watch this. One, two, three, watch me strain. <laughs> okay, five and a half Gs around the corner here, right over the shuttle landing facility. So you wanna know what five and a half Gs feels like? Well, that's what it looks like. <laughs> um, and that's when you, and you really do, because that pulls the blood down onto your head. That's what makes you wanna pass out, right? So you want to keep that blood up in the top part. So when you're getting ready to pull those G's, you go, it's just squeezing around like that. So that, that's what it's like. That, yes. Do you use uh, G suits? I got, well, I'm wearing a G suit. Yes, I was wearing a G suit here. Although I unplugged it for this flight because I wanted to see what the five and a half felt like without it. And it's a cakewalk. It really, after doing the centrifuge testing, it's a, it really is a cakewalk. It looks hard, but it's a cakewalk. Um, this is me flying the world's fastest stock L29 out at Reno. Um, and of course, not content to fly high and slow in the sky, I wanted to get kind of low and fast, so um, kind of take the leaves off the trees a little bit. Um, but you know, you gotta do these things just because you just have to. How could you not, right? You're in an aircraft that's going fast, and how could you not get low? So when my mom saw this vehicle, she thought, you know, it's kind of cool, except I really don't like the idea that it says experimental. <laughs> I said, get used to it, Mom, get used to it. So uh, a little bit more low and fast. Uh, we're only pulling about 4 Gs right here, so it's not that bad. Um, but, you know, you get low to the ground and you have some fun. Okay, um, this is one of my friends, Con, Constantine, where he is, there's me getting ready to float around. There's Con's dog floating around. There's Alan. Uh, this is what it looks like flying in the Zero-G aircraft. For somebody, by the way, this was Con's very first parabola. He's wearing a GoPro camera on the top of his head here. Can you turn the volume up? Actually, there's volume to this. Yeah, okay, don't go too loud because I think actually at this point the volume is cut out, but the next video will have volume. You, you can just adjust it in real time. Yeah. Um, we have to wear pressure suits on the x core vehicles because we're, we're flying to a test pilot vehicle, right? I mean, if something happens to the canopy while we're flying, I want to be in a, this pink little body wants to be in a spacesuit. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, Alan and I went out to Dave Clark Company, um, the company that actually manufactures these pressure suits for the for the U2s for the space shuttle. And uh, this is what it's like actually uh, squeezing yourself into one of those suits. But it's a lot more comfortable than it looks. It really is. <laughs> Frankly, it is. It zips up the back. Basically, the guy's there to zip it down, and then you just kind of grab up, pull the zipper up here, button a few things. Um, you know, ready to go hop in the centrifuge here. Um, You'll see me putting on the helmet here. All told, I'm weighing about $125,000 worth of pressure suit. Uh, this is not like cheap stuff. This is real like, you know, save your, save your bacon stuff and you wanna make sure it's actually gonna work. So this is not like, you know, some TV show type of spacesuit. This is the real thing. Um, it really does have to work. So uh, for those of us who wear glasses, um, you wanna wear very light framed glasses that bend very easy because there's a pressure seal around your face that you wanna make sure will seal well. So. Um, that knob right here in the back is what cinches the pressure seal on the suit um, and the inside the helmet around. So um, I'm, I'm, he's securing the one thing you do. These things are not meant for one person to do. You, you know, basically, you sit down and you let the people around you put your gloves on, and you know, you just sit still, let them do it. It's very Victorian. Yes.
spit as much as possible. <laughs> Thanks, Lon. Yeah, I understand. Are they still all right? Um, again, the gloves look worse than they are. They're they they they're very tactile. You can you can pick up a dime with them real easy. Um, I was doing all kinds of tests to you know. So there I'm spinning around. This is actually not the fast rate. I'm only doing like maybe maybe two G's at this point. This is kind of the rest G position. So um, so we were sitting inside. We were purposely doing things. They pump the suit up with pressure. Go under six G's for about thirty seconds of six G's. And reach up, and can I can I touch that dial? Can I do this there and see what that feels like? Um, pretty cool. So, anyway, a um, little sweaty there because you're sitting in this thing for you know an hour and a half doing six G. I'll tell you, six G's. Well, I say it's a cakewalk. It's it's not that bad, but six G's for about 12 of them in a row in a pressure suit. And after a while, you're kind of like, yeah, okay, I'm kind of glad that's over. <laughs> so um, fortunately, though, on these, uh, actually, it's looping again, so you can, you can either let them loop while I talk for a second or eh, just let them loop for a second. Um, the, uh, I'll turn the sound down now, actually, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, go ahead and do that, actually. If you've got that booked up, go and go and do it. The, um, the 6Gs that you get on re-entry in these vehicles is only a peak 6Gs. You only get it for about maybe two or three, ten seconds as it comes tailings back down to about, you know, five and a half, five, four. So it's not that bad. It's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I think he's got his... Oh, no, he's going to find it there. Are you doing this in real time or did you have to <coughs> Probably real time. Okay. Well, we'll do it in real time. Um, anybody have any questions? Uh, any more further questions about 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 this stuff? Um, this is going to be next year. Uh, about a year from finally, Andrea. I think finally a year from now, I can come back and tell you what it's going to be like. Okay. I can't you tell you that. You will come back. And I tell definitely us will come back. back. I can't tell you the dates. I, I know I know certain dates, but I can't tell you the ones. I think X Corps is going to be pretty much a year from now. I know that the Virgin flights for us are not going to be until the near the end more of 2014. Yes, sir? What if you need a heat shield? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because in this case, you're coming back into the atmosphere after a much more gentle suborbital flight. You're coming in back, at, uh, back in at about Mach 3, Mach 3 and a half <coughs> instead of Mach 25. Okay, so it's much less heating. Now, there is some heating on the vehicle, but it's nowhere near as extreme as, this, as coming back in from near the orbit. So it's a, in that sense, it's a much more gentle ride. Um, it'll still kill you <laughs> if something goes wrong. It just won't kill you as bad. So astronauts who are up there for long term, they have to be have protection available against uh, like solar right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. You're just taking the odds that it's not going to happen during those little bits that you're up there. And quite frankly, we're in a suborbital flight. Frankly, even most of the orbital flights, you're still within most of the magnetic bubble of the Earth. So, yeah. So this is this is the view the view out the rearview mirror, if you will. Offer a prize, and they will come. Thanks for finding this real time. That's good. Good to show. Today, something called the X Prize, a ten million dollar contest. To privately build a spaceship that's able to carry three individuals flying to 100 kilometers altitude and do that twice inside of two weeks. By defining the challenge with the Ansari X Prize, the X Prize Foundation ignited a new race to space, luring teams from around the globe. We're based in Mojave, California, Israel, Oklahoma, Forks, Washington, as the catalyst, the X Prize Foundation demonstrated an incentivized competition can change the world. I had a ten million dollar prize. You know, ten million dollars meant a lot to me. It certainly helped give us some focus. It's an obsession. Working evenings and nights and weekends. I have never been myself as creative as I have a eyeball in this ride. I'm not going to tell you what I've come up with because I want to win this. <laughs> This is, 
just to, this will give you a, a good sense of what that ride looks like. Hello and welcome to our hobby here in the high desert of California on this incredible day. Now you are going to witness history in the making. Remember, that's about half the size of Spaceship Two. That's what I meant by Wiley Coyote. And that's the view. That's what we're going to see. The Ansari X Prize inspired international competition, drove regulatory reform, and made history, dramatically demonstrating that space travel was not exclusively the province of government. The X Prize, it ignited a personal spaceflight revolution. Dedicated to pursuing high-profile prize competitions to foster innovation, the X-Prize Foundation is poised to address some of the world's greatest challenges. Cool, thanks. That's probably good enough. Awesome. Yeah, they're, they're, that was the sort of point. No, that's great. That's, that's awesome. I, 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 it covers the video that I really probably should have put in there myself. Sorry about that, guys. At least now you got to see it. So. Um, Maybe one or two more questions, and then I'll just say thanks a lot because it was a lot of fun, and I'm glad you guys are all packed the so room for. So, is seat 234 a window or an aisle seat? Yeah, right. Exactly. They're all window seats. For that price, they're all window seats. Believe me. And by the way, the windows are they're not windows the size of, an, of a of a commercial aircraft window. When you're sitting in there, you're about the same distance as you are from a commercial aircraft window, but that window is more like about this size. I mean, it's a it's a big view to space. So they and it's positioned about right there, so you don't have to like you know aircraft windows. You have to kind of like eh, I can't quite see. They, look, I mean, they know what you're going for. They've built this vehicle to maximize what you're going there for. Yeah, Spaceship Two on the on one of the first couple flights, uh, those those test flights when they dropped it off to go glide, they realized that eh, there's a little bit of, you know, you, you design the vehicle from the smaller one, you kind of think you can scale things up. Things don't always scale exactly right. Um, so the first couple flights, they realized like, you know, yeah, it's a little squirrely feeling. We better fix that a little bit. And they popped a little bit more area on the wings out there. Yeah, Th this is this is what you do. This is what you do test flights for. You should find out what works, what doesn't. So. Design, but they've got it straightened out now pretty well. Yeah. Wait, the parabolic um, boost. Yeah. Is there a warning that you're about to pull gravity again? Yeah, exactly. So um, you, you, you get about 23, 25 seconds, and they will, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't just go smack on. It, 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 it kind of comes back on at a point where you can kind of feel it, but they always will announce, there's an announcement that goes over the whole cockpit, feet down, coming out. Okay, so no matter what position you're in, you realize, you know, I better get myself back to the point where when my feet come back down, you're, you're, you're to here. The way those aircraft, those, those flights work, you go from about 25,000 feet up to 35,000 feet on those parabolas. When you're over the top, it's literally zero G. The pilots, it's not some magic computer thing. The pilots are just hand flying this zero G parabola. They're just watching their gauges, making sure that they're coasting over the top. When you're coming back down, on the bottom of that roller coaster, you're pulling about 1.8 Gs. So you're laying there kind of squished, feeling kind of heavy. And that's what actually makes most people sick. It's not the zero G part. It's the 1.8 Gs where they want to talk for the next minute and a half until the next parabola. Hey, wasn't that cool? And it's this stuff, turning your head when you're flying those arcs. You know, those are not good things to do to your inner ear when there's, you know. Uh, and the other advice I always give the newbies is, People make the mistake of thinking, well, I don't want to get sick. It might be embarrassing. I don't want to throw up on the plane, so I'm not going to eat anything. No, you don't want to do that. You want to eat. Okay? You want to have a nice breakfast that morning. You just don't want to have the big steak and eggs and all that kind of stuff. You want to eat light. Um, and I always recommend completely seriously, it's a really good food to eat for these type of flights. It's very gentle on your stomach, and it's good for you anyway, are bananas. Eat bananas. 
The other benefit of bananas, so I'm told, is they, say, they taste the same coming up as they do going down. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that problem. Well, that's a remark to remember. <laughs> we'll end it on that. How about that? So let's all thank our speaker. forward to come back and tell me what it's like so I can get you guys all to go to. Yeah. I want you all to have a phone call lining up there's enough time to get here from Boulder. Yep. By the way, um, the skies are still partly cloudy, but we do have a view of the moon right now. And so what I was thinking, um, we're so glad to have such a good audience and a big turnout for Dan's talk. But what we were thinking is to give the families and the younger kids first dibs looking through the 18-inch telescope. And since we can't fit, a, it's great to have such a big crowd, but we can't fit you all into the dome. <laughs> Take turns. Yep. But go see it. It's really cool, yeah. especially all you guys. Go, so go what we were thinking is to give the kids a first shot at the 18-inch telescope.